Good afternoon. I am Dr. Rosel de Ocampo de Maano, and today I am going to talk about end-of-life care, management of patients with advanced directives for anesthesia. I have no financial relationships with any commercial entity related to the content of this lecture. The objectives of this lecture are the following to review the types of advanced directives and present scenarios of patients with advanced directives scheduled for surgery, to discuss the role of the anesthesiologist in decision-making for patients with advanced directives scheduled for surgery, to discuss briefly the American Society of Anesthesiologists ethical guidelines on anesthesia care for patients with do not resuscitate status and other directives, to discuss the ethical considerations on perioperative DNR orders, and lastly, to discuss the ethical conflicts that may arise perioperatively when managing patients with advanced directives. The consensus definition of advanced care planning is that it is a process that supports adults at any age or stage of health in understanding and sharing their personal values life goals, and preferences regarding future medical care. Facilitating advanced care planning conversations is core business in palliative care, but within the perioperative period, surgeons and anesthesiologists play a key role in initiating such discussions as they hold expert specialized knowledge in procedure-specific risk and prognostication. Specific limitations of treatment in a perioperative ACP plays an important role in preventing inappropriate and futile care. The information presented in this lecture relates primarily to the U.S. Internationally, there is considerable variation in the terminology, documentation, and legislative frameworks related to ACP and providing comprehensive information about ACP in all regions of the world is beyond the scope of this lecture. However, many of the concepts discussed in detail are globally applicable. Advanced directives are the documents a person completes while still in possession of decisional capacity about how treatment decisions should be made on his behalf in the event he loses the capacity to make such decisions. They are legal tools directing treatment decision-making and or appoint surrogate decision-makers. It is important to remember that advanced directives are only acted upon when the patient has lost the ability to make decisions for himself and that it can be revoked orally or in writing by the patient at any time, so long as they have maintained decisional capacity. The primary instruments that serve as advanced directive documents for purposes of advanced care planning are the living will and the durable power of attorney for healthcare. Other documents utilized in healthcare decision making include combined directives and physician orders for life-sustaining treatment. The living will is the oldest form of advanced directive. It is a document summarizing a person's preferences for future medical care. Typically, the living will addresses resuscitation and life support. However, a thorough living will may cover patients' preferences regarding hospitalization, pain control, and specific treatments that they may require in the future and can be modified by the patient to include specific interventions such as cardiopulmonary resuscitation, ventilatory support, or enteral feeding. Living wills are only applicable to seriously ill, incapacitated patients and cannot cover all possibilities. On the other hand, a durable power of authority for healthcare is a signed legal document authorizing another person to make medical decisions on the patient's behalf in the event 
the patient loses decisional capacity. Increasingly, advanced care planning documents are being developed that include components of the living will, the values history, and the instructional directive, while also designating a surrogate decision maker. One example of this, known as five wishes, combines the living will and the durable power of attorney for health care. Although not an advanced directive, physician orders for life-sustaining treatment and similar medical order forms provide explicit direction about resuscitation status if the patient is pulseless and apneic. Allow me to share a case scenario from the article written by Loeb et al. that was published in the American Medical Association Journal of Ethics. It examines perioperative suspension of a DNR order during surgery. It considers the appropriateness of DNR orders, types of DNR order suspension in the context of alternative anesthesia techniques and what is required from a surgeon, anesthesiologist, and patient or surrogate to reach a decision expressing the patient's best interest. Mrs. B, a 76-year-old woman with dementia, is brought to the emergency department after she fell at her nursing home. An X-ray reveals a left femoral neck fracture and she is seen by an orthopedic consultant, Dr. S, who recommends surgical repair. Mrs. B has numerous comorbidities, including aortic stenosis and chronic atrial fibrillation. To treat these conditions, she takes a blood thinner. Mrs. B also uses supplemental oxygen to treat her COPD. For the past three years, her husband took care of her at home and was her surrogate decision maker. Since her husband's recent death, Mrs. B's son, who lives abroad, placed her in a skilled nursing facility. Last year, Mrs. B's husband agreed with clinicians' recommendation that Mrs. B's code status should be DNR. Mrs. B's son, who is her current surrogate decision maker, continues to agree with this, his recommendation. That night, an orthopedic surgeon, Dr. O, explains via telephone to Mrs. B's son that surgery should be done within 24 hours to achieve the best possible outcome, and that the goals of surgery are to restore Mrs. B's hip mobility and help palliate her pain. Mrs. B's son gives consent for his mother to undergo surgery in the morning. In the morning, with surgery scheduled to begin in 30 minutes, the anesthesiologist, Dr. A, meets Mrs. B in the preoperative holding area. She is agitated and disoriented. Dr. A calls Mrs. B's son to confirm her past medical history and explains that based on her comorbidities, she is a, at high risk for complications and adverse outcomes. Dr. A also explains that in many cases, a patient's DNR order is suspended during and immediately after surgery. Mrs. B's son seems surprised. This is the first time I'm hearing about her being high risk. And well, the DNR, She's been DNR for years. Why would I suspend it now? I just talked with the surgeon yesterday about this. I thought this procedure would help reduce her pain. After a pause, Mrs. B's son receives consent for his mother's surgery. Dr. S is surprised and frustrated to learn this news. Mrs. B needed his operation and delaying it will only increase her risk of mortality and other complications. Dr. A replies, I agree that the surgical goals make sense overall, but Mrs. B is a sick, frail, elderly person 
for whom a DNR order has been appropriately in place for many years. She could die during surgery or she could make it through but then require ventilator and intensive care. Her son was surprised when I mentioned suspending her DNR order. They stood together, concerned about what to do next for Mrs. B. In 2001, in 2008, and in October 2013, the ASA published the ethical guidelines for anesthesia care of patients with do not resuscitate orders or other directives that limit treatment. It states that policies automatically suspending DNR orders may not sufficiently address a patient's rights to self-determination in a responsible and ethical manner. Such policies should be reviewed and revised. The guideline suggested three options for suspending DNR orders in perioperative settings. First is the full attempt at resuscitation. Second is the limited attempt at resuscitation defined with regard to specific procedures. And last is the limited attempt at resuscitation defined with regard to the patient's goals and values. These three options still guide practice today. The administration of anesthesia necessarily involves some practices and procedures that might be viewed as resuscitation in other settings. Prior to procedures requiring anesthetic care, any existing directives to limit the use of resuscitation procedures should, when possible, be reviewed with the patient or designated surrogate. The status of these directives should be clarified or modified based on the preferences of the patient. In advanced directives with specific procedures approach, the patient or designated surrogate may elect to continue to refuse certain specific resuscitation procedures. For example, chest compressions, defibrillation, or tracheal intubation. The anesthesiologist should inform the patient or designated surrogate about which procedures are essential to the success of the anesthesia and the proposed procedures, and which procedures are not essential and may be refused. With the goals directed approach, the patient or designated surrogate may allow the anesthesiologist and surgical or procedural team to use clinical judgment in determining which resuscitation procedures are appropriate in the context of the situation and the patient's stated goals and values. For example, some patients may want full resuscitation procedures to be used to manage adverse clinical events that are believed to be quickly and easily reversible but to refrain from treatment for conditions that are likely to result in permanent sequelae, such as neurologic impairment or unwanted dependence upon life-sustaining technology. The ASA guidelines were adopted by the American College of Surgeons and the Association of Operating Room Nurses. And as a result, all three professional organizations now advocate for the fundamental right of self-determination for competent patients to define and limit what treatment will be provided to them in the operating or procedural suite. To prevent conflicts, not only anesthesiologists, but also surgeons and nurses must agree beforehand about how to manage this ethically, psychologically, and emotionally perplexing scenarios. When making decisions about the perioperative care for patients with DNR orders, physicians should always apply four principles of ethics. The first and most important is patient autonomy. This principle recognizes a patient's right to self-determination and is the basis for informed consent. The second principle is non-maleficence, a concept 
that is rooted in every healthcare provider's mind as first, do no harm. The third principle is beneficence. This motivates healthcare providers to do good for their patients while also acting to remove them from harm. The fourth principle is distributive justice. The idea that society should balance resources to allow the most number of patients to benefit. Essentially, this principle asks society as a group to be fair and equitable. Now, let us go back to our case scenario. There is discord among the anesthesiologist, surgeon, and Mrs. B. Sun, the surrogate, who believes that his mother's longstanding DNR order and his consent for anesthesia are fundamentally irreconcilable. He acts on this belief by withdrawing consent for his mother's surgery without adequate discussion with her anesthesiologist and surgeon. While the surgeon and anesthesiologist agree about whether imminent surgery is appropriate, most likely they are working together to support Mrs. B's best interest but have not yet reached agreement. A good next step for Dr. Ace and S would be to invite collaborative discussion with her son with the goal of explaining to him that her situation is more nuanced than the binary option he sees before him. Specifically, Mrs. B's son needs help seeing the two limited attempt at resuscitation options with partial DNR order suspension that are intermediate between the two extremes of surgery with complete DNR order suspension and no surgery due to maintenance of the DNR order with resuscitative attempts disallowed. Another option not currently visible to Mrs. B's son is proceeding with surgery while keeping the DNR order in place. Mrs. B's son's perception of a lack of choices suggests that he might not fully understand clinically relevant facts about hip fractures in general or what's at stake for his mother in terms of surgical management of her injury. This and other specific points would likely be helpful focal points of discussion to make sure his consent or refusal is adequately informed. Dr. S should discuss the nature and surgical management of the hip fracture in detail with Dr. A and Mrs. B. Sun, as the details of the case might influence the anesthesiologist's technique and the son's decision. For example, a displaced femoral neck fracture might require two hours of operating time, lateral positioning, muscle paralysis of the patient, and a large open approach for hemiarthroplasty. However, a non-displaced femoral neck fracture might require 30 minutes, supine positioning of the patient, no paralysis, and placement of three percutaneous screws, which could be performed under minimal anesthesia or with a peripheral block. Dr. S should discuss risks and benefits of non-operative and operative treatment options to help clarify goals of care for Mrs. B. Dr. S should also explain that Mrs. B's risk for complications is high and why surgery is still recommended despite those risks. Doctors A and S are responsible for educating their patient surrogate and helping him cultivate understanding so that he can give informed consent or refusal for surgery and other interventions over the course of his mother's care. Doctors A and S should consult Mrs. B's health record and Mrs. B's son about her pre-existing DNR order, specifically whether endotracheal intubation or electrical defibrillation is permitted. Alternative anesthesia options should also be explored, including use of positive pressure ventilation, base-active medications, and a regional block. Frequently, 
patients and surrogates are unaware of these anesthetic techniques. Explaining these options to Mrs. Bison could motivate fuller and deeper understanding of her care and lead to agreement on her treatment plan. Even if that plan is to perform white awake surgery under regional anesthesia with an active DNR order, for example. Although surgery under an active DNR order could be uncomfortable for doctors A and S, the risks and benefits of surgery in the face of no resuscitative ability should be discussed with Mrs. B's son and fully considered. In this case, it is important that doctors A and S and Mrs. B's son all understand these facts. Recall that the health outcomes of patients with a natural history of hip fractures are extremely poor. While risk of a patient dying during surgery is real, one-year mortality risk without surgery is high. Simply framing the treatment options as surgery or non-operative management is misleading, as both options have significant mortality and morbidity risks. The patient or surrogate, surgeon, and anesthesiologist must be honest, recognizing that no treatment pathway for a frail patient is without risk. If Mrs. B's son refuses all surgical intervention after discussing the details just considered, discussion should proceed to risks and prognosis of non-operative management of Mrs. B's injury. A goals of care discussion would be helpful at this time, as would a palliative medicine consultation. Perioperative DNR conversations are time consuming but vital. Advanced care planning should be examined on an individual case by case basis and re-examined with relevant changes in a patient's health status and clinical context. Although negotiating which resuscitative techniques are indicated and appropriate is typically the purview of an anesthesiologist, it is imperative that the patient or surrogate, surgeon, and anesthesiologist jointly discuss and share their perspectives to motivate informed and shared decision-making. Ideally, discussion should occur as soon as surgery is planned to avoid surprise or conflict just prior to surgery. If the patient or surrogate, anesthesiologist or surgeon disagree about the terms of perioperative DNR suspension, surgery should be delayed until effective communication is established or restored to forge consensus or at least facilitate agreement. I am going to end my lecture with a quote from Haruki Murakami. Death is not the opposite of life, but a part of it. Thanks for listening and stay safe, everybody. <music>